I wanted to point out a feature that I know is not being utilized that much, and that's if we uh, utilize the class update, which as we know, blasts out an announcement to the students, uh, not only putting it in their news feed on their main page, in their news feed on whatever that course is or group that they're involved in, but also most of our students choose to get email notifications and or text message notifications when you send them an update. So one of the things we can do in update uh, besides attaching files, uh, links, resources, etc., is we can attach a poll. So this is a really nice way to do an exit ticket or even a do now. You can have students log into their class and respond to a poll that's a do now and use the votes um, to spark some sort of class discussion or to gather some quick information. So um, all you need to do to complete a poll is click on the poll. And you type whatever you want your prompt to be in here. So let's say I want to ask my students, um, let's say, what is your favorite winter drink? And I can make the options hot chocolate, hot cider, and let's say tea and coffee. Now, of course, you do have to tell Schoology where you're posting this to. So I have a fake class in here called Biology Section 1. And then I can just click Post. Now, alternatively, instead of typing in Biology Section 1, you could be in that course under the Updates section, and you could just post it directly from there. Now, what's kind of nice about the polls within Schoology updates is they are live so they change automatically they refresh automatically they're also anonymous um, so you don't have to worry about student confidentiality or you know being honest because they will be honest they know they're not being tracked um, however students can change their response which ends up being good and bad so I'll show you an update that's already been completed I go to this eighth grade class. I did send this exact same question out to the eighth grade class just to see what the polls were looking like. Okay, so here's how the votes come in. You can see that we have 32 votes here for hot chocolate, coffee, tea, hot cider. Um, now, if you look, I already voted for hot chocolate, but if I change my answer to coffee, it does let me change my vote. So the vote will remain dynamic, and there's really there's no way to shut it down. You can delete it. Um, and you can edit it, but you can't necessarily shut it down and, and cease voting, so it will remain dynamic. So if you're looking for a definite final answer when you're done collecting the data, you could always screenshot this and save this, but um, it does continue to let the students change their opinions. This could be kind of neat if you started class with an opinionated do now and allowed students to vote on it, and then after educating them or a lesson or discussion, you could ask them to reopen the poll and if they would like to change their vote and see how the votes come out differently. Um, so those are polls within Schoology. So the next feature I'm going to show you is the student completion rules. The student completion rules are sort of like a little known feature that are excellent for um, self-paced lessons, uh, self-paced modules, um, or just a group of resources that you want students to have accountability for or want some sort of rules to them. So I'll show you what I mean by that. Now I'm just in a course here. I have a fake class here and I have a folder called Cell Transport. And if I open that folder, as you can see, there are a number of resources in it. So if you are sort of using this as a unit where students have to work through these uh, documents sort of at their own pace or maybe you're flipping a lesson or you know they're doing some sort of self-paced module you can actually take the cog next to this folder expand that cog and click on this green check that says student completion and you can actually force students to go in a certain chronological order or you can force them to complete certain items within that folder so if I click on add requirement and here out of this drop down menu you have to say what you're adding a requirement for. Now here's all the resources in that folder. So the first one is just a Word document. Now obviously with a Word document that's all it is. It's a document. The only thing you can require students to do is actually view the item. So as long as they click on that item, they've quote-unquote completed that, that step. Um, you can also, uh, therefore, lock the remainder of the items based on that.
So if that's the only thing I wanted the students to have to do is they have to view that item before they can open anything else, I can click this, click Save Changes. And now as you can see underneath my cell transport folder, I have a little gray um, must complete font here that basically says there's some student completion rules. So if I expand this now, um, I can still see all of my items, but what, what the students will see is they will see all of these items, but they will only be able to click on the cell transport dock. Now until they click that, all of these other items will be grayed out and they won't be able to access them unless they've completed that step, which is viewing this item. Now let's add a couple more requirements here. So I'm just going to go back to student completion again. I can add some more requirements. I can say that I also want them in order to complete that folder or that packet. I want them to have to open up this cell transport graphs. Now this was an assignment where they had to make a submission. So I can say member must, and there are a number of things you can require them to do. So maybe you only want them to post a comment or reply in that assignment. Maybe you want them to have to make a submission. Maybe you want them to have to score a certain percentage. So here's where you can actually make some stipulations on an assignment. So for example, in this particular assignment, I wanted students to create an Excel graph and then submit it. So here I would just do make a submission. Now I can add another requirement. So if I want students to have all of those items locked until those two things are done, this is how I would leave it. However, if I wanted students to have to complete this Word document before this assignment, I can check this box and say requirements must be completed in sequential order. If you don't care what order they complete these in, in order to unlock the remainder of the items, you can leave that unchecked. But I'm just going to say that I already ordered them the way I want students to access them, and I want them to do them in order. Um, I can go to Add Requirement again. I'm going to access this Notes. This is just a link, so the only option is for students to view the item. I'm going to add another requirement for the next. The next one is a PowerPoint. Again, students can only view the item. Then I have a PDF. Again, this is just a document. View item. Okay, here's another link. It's actually a video. So I would have my students view that item. And finally, I have a little quiz here at the end. And I'm going to say that my students have to score at least a 75 in order to have the packet be completed. So right now, students would have to complete all of these items in sequential order for the packet to show up as green and complete. So if I click Save Changes, now I have all my completion rules in place. So when the students log in right now, the way we set up this folder, they would have to actually complete these items in order. So each one will not be visible until the previous one is unlocked by your completion rule. Now when you come in here to this folder, now, if I go to Options and Student Completion, um, I don't have any students in this class, but what I'll get is a list of my students, and it will say how far by a percentage each student has proceeded through that folder. And so you have a very quick view of who still needs to do what items and what resources within the folder and who's sort of still lagging behind. So those are student completion rules. Another little known feature we have here in Schoology is the workload planning tool. So the workload planning tool sort of lets you help plan um, large assessments, especially for our students that are in 7th, 8th, and ninth grade that are still kind of adjusting to um, time management skills and things like that. So if you go to any of your courses, so I'm going to go to um, an area where I know I have students, okay? So if I'm now in courses and I click on workload planning, and you could be in any of your classes right now. All right, I get a list of all of the students within that class. So I actually made a class with all of the seventh graders in it, so yours isn't going to look this large. It'll only have the students in your class, but click on workload planning, and this actually gives you a breakdown uh, of the week, <clears throat> and 
it lets you know how many students are above the minimum number of assignments. So as you can see, we have the red here is 50% are over the minimum, um, and I have my minimum set to two or more items. Now items are anything that tracks as an assignment in Schoology. So these are assignments they have. So if you skim down here, as you can see, we have this student has three assignments today. Um, so this lets you know really how busy your class is and what assignments they have going on in other classes. Sort of lets you peek at their other stuff. So if I click on Casey Allen and these three assignments, I can see that she's got German homework due today for Mrs. Erdman. She's got a, a quiz in English for Ms. McElrath. Uh, and she has a pre-algebra uh, worksheet for Mrs. Mills. So um, this is sort of lets you know that, you know, Kaylee, or excuse me, Casey is, is really busy today, so if you're thinking about assigning her social studies homework, maybe not the best idea, uh, but this sort of gives you a peek into your other students. So it's just another tool I wanted to make everyone aware of. So one of my favorite features of Schoology is its ability to have these safe discussion environments where students can interact, teachers can sort of monitor, teachers can facilitate, we can make edits if we need to, um, but discussions, online discussions are one of the best things out there. And as students move into the, um, you know, the upper grades and they prepare for college, online discussions and being part of a learning management system is a skill that they're absolutely going to need and it's a skill you've probably used in, in graduate courses. Um, especially because it offers, you know, convenience of being at home um, and doing it on the time that, that you have the ability to. So um, this is great in the high school setting because it allows you to hear all of your students equally. We only have 43 minutes a day with the students and we don't necessarily get into the depth of discussion that we want to. We don't necessarily get to hear from all of our students. So this allows us to hear all of our students equally um, and that increases their voice but it also increases accountability as well. It allows us to hear from shy students uh, that would not not necessarily speak up in class. It also helps foster writing skills. So because students know that their writing is going to be posted there, they're more likely to spend more time um, crafting you know, an argument or uh, a statement or a reaction um, with a little bit more substance and hopefully proofread it and make it uh, something worth uh, their peers reading. Uh, it also gives us extended time, as I mentioned, to uh, break away from that 43-minute barrier and, you know, uh, extend our in-class discussions uh, to something at home. It's also, as I mentioned, asynchronous, so it's not necessarily live, and students, if they want to do it in between soccer and dinner, they can, or if they want to do it on their couch at night, they can. Um, and it also allows some students prefer the time to sort of digest and think about whatever they want to write before they necessarily blurt it out right there in class, and they want to, you know, really put some thought into it. So, Brett, best practices of... Schoology discussions and online discussions in general. How are teachers using them? Um, how can you use them? And you know, some ways think outside the box a little bit and maybe use them differently than you have in the past. So, this is one of the best examples I've seen of uh, an online discussion being used in a class. And I saw this a couple weeks ago, and I just thought it was so awesome. So. This teacher started a discussion post within Schoology and just allowed students to keep their laptops open to that discussion page during the lecture. <clears throat> and they recorded any questions that they had or thoughts throughout the lecture uh, within this discussion post. So as the teacher was lecturing, the students were recording questions within here. And then if other students knew the answer, they were, instead of interrupting the lecture to ask a question, they were responding to their peers within there. And any questions that had not been addressed were addressed at the end of class in the last couple minutes, any questions that had not been answered in that discussion forum. So this was a really neat practice. This is probably the most common uh, way that teachers here use uh, Schoology discussions, and that's they post a document or a video and ask students um, either for a reaction, for an opinion, um, to relate it to something they've been doing in class. Um, and this is great as well, and it allows students, all of these allow students to respond to one another's comments, and you get a good um, threaded, meaty discussion going on. 
I've also seen continuation of a story. So as far as creative writing purposes, um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be for a creative writing class, um, the prompt for students to write can be grounded in something that they are learning in class, or students might have to tie in concepts they are learning in class, but a teacher may choose to begin a story or begin a, um, you know, some sort of textual passage and students in the threaded discussion will have to continue that story based on what their peers wrote before them. So brainstorming, uh, this is a really neat one too, uh, not necessarily for a whole class because that can get a little crazy, uh, but you can use this to brainstorm for a project or an idea and you know just post the discussion area so students can use it to aggregate their information and their ideas as, as you know the idea development moves on. Uh, brainstorming is really good if you want to create discussions um, for just a group of students and I will show you how to do that. You don't necessarily have to design um, the discussion and, ass and assign it to the entire class. You can assign it to a group of students or just a one student if you want. You can also use it for peer review so students can choose to post um, you know uh, passages or even whole papers in there and uh, you can use this area for students to peer review one another's work and comment on it. And also as I mentioned before extend in class discussions and you know this can be done on the fly if you guys are having a great class discussion and you are out of time you can throw the discussion post up there really quick and just allow students an area um, to continue that discussion in a safe way that you can you know continue to monitor it. So let's take a look at some of the features of discussions that you may not know are there. Okay, so let's see some of these features of discussions that I want to make sure everyone knows about so we're all utilizing discussions to their fullest potential. So you can be in a course or a group, it doesn't matter. Um, you can start a discussion in either one. So I do actually use, um, for my student council, uh, discussion posts as well in here. But I'm just going to stay in this fake course I have here and under materials I'm going to click add discussion. So under Add Discussion, I know we, we title the discussion here. Um, let's say we're going to have a discussion about self-driving cars in biology class because we're talking about the environment. And I can um, place my prompt within here. So I can say, um, please see the video attached and discuss the following questions and I'm gonna worry about posting that video later but I'm just gonna put some questions in here right now I will say do you think you would ever buy a self-driving car would you feel safe as a passenger in a self-driving car Be sure to include why or why not. Now, if you feel like your students need the additional directions, like must be three to five sentences, must complete and you must write and complete sentences, must use vocabulary terms from this week's ecology lesson. So these are all of things you can include in your in your discussion. But I'm just going to keep this one simple for now. So I wanted to show you some of the stuff down here. First of all, it is really good idea to always put a due date on something. So even if you're not going to grade it, whenever you're going to do it in class or whenever you know you want it completed by, put a due date on there. Um, and here's why. As long as you put a due date on here, it will put it on the students' calendars automatically. So when they log into um, their Schoology and click on their calendar, all of their assignments and discussions and tests and things like that for all of their classes aggregate in that one place on that calendar and it helps keep them organized so if you are expecting them to comp complete something like this and by a certain date um, it's best to put a date on it. So if you click enable grading um, this is where you're going to have the ability later to push this to the grade book in PowerSchool. So if you're not going to enable grading um, and you don't want to ever grade it and worry about points and things like that, don't worry about this. But if you do want the ability to be able to push it to gradebook later, you do need to click enable grading. Um, 
I'm also going to show you in a later segment how to assign a rubric to this. Um, for uh, grading their responses. Um, and there are pre-made rubrics already in Schoology I'm going to show you. All right, but let's uncheck that for now. And let's worry a little bit more about this stuff down here. So here is where you can, instead of assigning it to this whole biology section, if I want to assign it just to, say, one group of students that's working on this topic, you can click on individually assign these little three markers here. And, oops. I exited out of it. Let's go back in here. All right, so if I click on individually assign, I can now start typing student names down here. So if I start typing Mark, because I know Mark is in this group, and then I can hit enter. Let's say I only want to assign it to Mark and Kathy Timpone. This will now only show up in their materials list. It will not show up in the other students' lists. So if I, if I say forget it, I want to assign it to the whole class, I just X out of that, and I unclick this button. Okay, so next one I want to show you um, is uh, this button. This button, members can see other responses before participating. So by default, when students log into a discussion, they will be able to see all of their classmates' responses before posting their own. If you want them to be locked out of seeing their classmates' responses, so they have to come up with their own response and post first before they can see what everyone else wrote, you can click this, and now that it's highlighted, they will be locked out from seeing their peers' responses before they post their own. So that's kind of cool, especially if you're having them, say, respond all to the same article and you don't want them to kind of steal each other's ideas. That's nice. Um, this is kind of nice, too, the shared discussion button. The shared discussion is for is great, especially for um, if you're trying to share ideas between classes. I know some classes, some of you guys that teach specials and stuff, um, have relatively small sections. And it's kind of hard to get a great discussion going with only like five or six students. So if you click on shared discussion, as you can see, all of my other sections show up here. So if I want my eighth grade class to participate as well and the ninth grade class, I can select other sections to participate in this discussion and it will show up to all three sections. So that's kind of neat as well. So now I want to come back and we'll start talking about ways we can enhance this discussion uh, by doing some really cool embed features. So I'm going to show you how to embed media into some of your features on Schoology. So this will help you enhance your writing prompts, enhance your assignments, um, get your students to uh, really engage in some media-rich literacy um, instead of just reading. So this can be used in assignments. This can be used in discussions. This can be used in the ad page area. So I'm going to show it to you in ad discussion, but it can be used across um, many of these features. So I'm going to click on Add Discussion and let's return to that uh, self-driving cars topic. Now within the description area, this button right here, it's the insert content button. It's a little box with an arrow going into it. This is the best button in all of Schoology. So if I click on this, some of you may have already used this image slash media button. This allows you to just insert a picture um, or a diagram or a piece of artwork or whatever you want the students to respond to or reference um, within that discussion. So I'll just click on that. We'll do that real quick and I'll click attach file. And let me just access my desktop. And I have this just nice owl head here. We'll put that in there and um, there's my owl head. So as you can see, it does come in kind of big, and if that happens, what you need to do is scroll all the way to the bottom right, and then there's a little tiny slider bar down here, and you can resize your photo. Um, you can also put the cursor beside the photo and use the alignment buttons to move the photo to center or right if you'd like. Um, but I'm just gonna delete that. We don't really need that. You guys probably already knew that one, that's okay. I'm going to go back to that insert content button, but here I'm going to look at the right hand side. So we do have some awesome features that weren't here when Schoology first came out, but they're here now and they're here to be awesome. Um, so we have YouTube, 
uh, directly from within here. So we no longer have to use an embed code to put YouTube videos within our discussions, within our assignments, within our pages. We can actually put the YouTube video right here and search from within Schoology. So let's say I want to look up um, self-driving cars. Hit enter. Okay, so um, let's say here's the video I want to use. Um, I just hit the check mark next to it. I click on this import menu and then import as embed. All right, now it may look like it didn't work because you're like, oh, what's this yellow box? This doesn't look like it worked. It did work. All you have to hit is create when you're done finalizing all of those options within there. And now if I click on self-driving cars, my video comes up embedded and the students can play it right from within their Schoology discussion or their Schoology assignment or page or whatever. So you don't have to have students open a new tab and get distracted. This plays right from the discussion and then they have their questions and their writing prompt right there for them to reference. They can also be writing their reply as they watch the video, which is a nice feature for them as well. They don't have to split screen or keep flipping back and forth or anything like that. So I'm going to click back on this cog that lets me edit my discussion. Now, if you wanted this centered, it's the same thing. You just place the cursor beside it and click on center, and that will allow you to do so. Now, if you want to get rid of it, all you have to do is click on it, and you get this uh, little X box, and you can get rid of it. I'm going to go back to insert content. I'm going to show you a couple more in here. Um, Khan Academy also lets you import directly from within. So um, this doesn't have as nice of a search tool. It kind of lets you skim through this stuff. Uh, but if you use the command F on your keyboard, you can certainly look for things. So I just typed in cars. Um, so there's not really any... Uh, I guess videos on Khan Academy with cars, but let's just say this sounded like what I want to use. And then I can click on this little button to embed this video. And there we have it. We have a Khan Academy video now embedded in my Schoology discussion. Okay, same thing. So again, I'm going to go back to edit. I'm going to get rid of this in the same way I did the last video. I'm going to go back to insert content. Here's another one you may choose or want to use. I can embed anything from my Google Drive as well. So that means a Google Doc, a Google Spreadsheet, a Google Presentation, whatever. So if I click on Google Drive, I already have my Google Drive synced to my Schoology and all of my resources within my Google Drive pop up here. So let's say I want, um, I'm going to discuss this technology budget with my students. If I check next to that, I can do import, import embed. All right, so now let's see how that looks if I click on save changes. Okay, so you sort of get a little window peek into the into the Google Doc. Now what's nice about this is it's live. So if I go back and edit my Google spreadsheet or my Google Doc, it will continue to show up live within the Schoology discussion here, which is great. So some people, when I did this workshop, were like, oh, that's so little. So let's see how we can make this better. If I click on this cog again, click on edit, here's how you can manipulate how big that shows up. If I double click this area and then click on the picture here, there was a little picture button. I know this looks complicated. Don't be nervous. Here's the dimensions in pixels that this is showing up. You don't need to worry about um, any of this. All you need to do is pick something bigger. So right now it's 560 by 315. I'm gonna do like 800. Now I'm gonna do like 800, but then instead of entering proportions here, I'm just gonna hit tab. And it calculates a good ratio for this to become. So you don't want it to be stretched height or width, or width. So if you just put in what you want it to be for one of these dimensions and then hit tab, it will calculate what it needs to be for the other dimension. So if I hit 900 and tab over, it says, okay, then you would need this dimension to be 506, whatever. I don't know that. So it calculates it automatically and then click insert. Now I'll click save changes and we'll see how that looks now. 
Okay, so as you can see, I can see much more of my spreadsheet now. There, there's no need to even scroll. So if you run into that issue, that's how you can sort of manipulate those, those things. So I'm going to come back here again to this embed tool. I'm going to click edit again. I'm going to get rid of that. And let's show you guys one more just for fun, just for the road. I'm going to show you how to embed a Google map and it's a live Google map. So I'm actually going to come up here to my browser and open a new tab. There's no automatic search for this one just yet. Um, I'm going to click on a new tab. I'm going to go to maps.google.com. Let's say we're having a discussion about uh, Baltimore, Maryland. All right, so I bring this up in Google Maps. And here's Baltimore. Now I can choose to zoom in as much as I want, or I can zoom out as much as I want. I can even switch between the earth view and the street view if I want. Okay, the earth view is nice if you're trying to show students bodies of water especially. But I'm going to click back to the regular map view. Now, once I have the view that I want in this screen, if I click on these three little dashes up here, this little menu, I can do share or embed map, click on that. Click on this second option that says embed map and all you need to do is copy what's in here. So I'm going to hit Command C to copy this link. And then I'm just going to X out of this. I'm going back to my Schoology tab. And under the Insert Content, I'm just going to go to Image slash Media. But instead of Upload Media, I'm going to go from the web. Now it's not an image, it's actual media, so we have to click on Media. And now you just take that embed code and you paste and go insert. And now let's see how that looks. And there you have it. We have our map of Baltimore inserted in here. Now, this is not just a picture. I know you're saying, Tina, why don't I just screenshot it? You don't have to because look, now students can actually manipulate this map. They can zoom in and they can use this map interactively. So they will initially land wherever you set up that link to start. So this was the exact view we set up that link to start. This was how far zoomed in and out and left and right and all that stuff we were. Um, but then they have the ability to manipulate it right from within here. They don't need to go out to Google Maps. So one of the things I want to show you, that's, that's it for embedding for now, but one of the things I want to point out, and I have foreign language teachers using this already, so uh, kudos to you guys, but when students do type responses down here, they have the option to insert content as well. Um, as far as links, they don't have the ability to uh, do media-rich content like you're doing up here, but they can insert links and symbols equations. They can also respond using an audio or video recording. So they don't necessarily have to text type. So for something like Ruth McAlargy's Spanish class, she may choose to have students respond in Spanish um, and where she wants to hear their accent and their, uh, you know, where they're notating certain syllables and things like that. So you can actually use this audio video recording for your students to respond. So audio and video is obviously if you want to see them as well. Um, audio is if you just want to hear them. Uh, the one thing to, to note when students are doing this, especially for the first time, is if I click on audio video, um, it may prompt them, so I've already used mine, so it's not asking for it, but it may prompt them to whether or not they want to give permission to the microphone to Google Chrome, and uh, obviously they, they want to hit yes, I give permission. So all they have to do is click on the record button, so then they record their response in Spanish, blah, blah, blah. Then they can hit stop. Then they can hit insert. Now, the weird thing is, right now, it looks like it won't let you post anything. And this is sort of a weird quirk that we found out the hard way. You have to actually write something, too. So if you don't want them to have to write anything, you can just have them hit the space bar. And then it gives them the ability to post. So now I can post my video recording. Oh, it makes me write. So this is my answer post. 
Okay, now um, this is pending right now. See, it says this file is currently being converted into viewable format. Um, what's going to happen is very shortly, Schoology converts this to a little embedded video and they can all play one another's video and listen to one another right from within there. And then they can even respond to one another's, not just your prompt. So these are just some extra ways that you can use discussions. And again, all of these embed things I showed you can be used in assignments and pages as well. promised, I do want to add in here how you can um, associate an assignment or a discussion uh, with a rubric within Schoology now and grade it with the rubric. Um, and therefore, obviously, once you grade it all, you can push your grades um, to PowerSchool or to Genesis. So um, if you actually go up into your resources section, there is an area called public resources. So um, there are rubrics already created that tons of people share their stuff in here. Now, if you can't find what you're looking for, obviously don't worry about it, but you can look through here and there's tons of resources in here. You can search for resources by subject, by level, etc. cetera. Um, I just happen to know that um, there's a good uh, rubric in a folder called Icebreakers because I already found it once before. So if I go within here, um, any of the anything you find that you like, if you click on it, next to it it'll say added, meaning it's it's put now in your library of resources. So mine already said added because I already added it. But so mine says added. Now if I go back to resources and go to personal, you're probably gonna be like, oh my god, where'd it go? It's not added. You have to go to downloads. Those are things that you've uh, downloaded from the public library. So within here now, if I click on this icebreakers folder, I knew there was a good rubric for discussions in here. So now if I click on that rubric, I, I don't have to keep it the way it is. I don't have to keep this name. So I'm actually going to change this name, rubric for discussions. I can come in here and change. Um, I can change the order of the, this criteria. I can uh, manipulate how many points each is worth. I can manipulate um, all of the... Uh, verbiage used to collect each one of these point values. But I'm just going to leave it the way it is and how much it's worth for now. I can even add criteria. I can associate it with learning objectives, all of that good stuff. I'm just going to click save for now. Uh, alternatively, I'm going to go back to home to my resources. You can come in here to add resources and create your own rubric from scratch. Now, as you know, creating a rubric does take a little bit of time, but you, if you already had one that you liked to use on Word document, you put it in here and it is somewhat front-loaded the first time, but then the rubric is always associated with that. You don't have to make tons of copies of rubrics, and the students will always have um, access to their grades after that, and even if they lose their rubric or, you know, whatever. Furthermore, the rubric will always stay in your library, and you can use it for other discussions as well. So now that I have my rubric here, I'm going to go back out to courses. I'm going to go back to biology here, section one. I'm going to click on that discussion I made before and click edit. I'm going to enable grading. It has to be enabled for you to associate it with a rubric. I'm just going to put it as a classwork grade. And under scale slash rubric, now any, any rubrics that you have saved in your resource folder will now show up in this list. So I have my rubric here, and I can show whether or not I want to show it to students. So if, if I want students to be able to view that rubric before they even respond to the discussion, I can click Show to Students, Save Changes. All right, and now they will have the ability to look at the rubric uh, right here before they even post their response. Okay, and here we go. Here was what I was talking about before. Now it's a playable version that can be played right from within here. It's not, it's not like they have to download a file or anything like that and view it in another um, program. It plays right within Schoology. 
Um, so I know this was a lot of stuff in only a short amount of time, but I wanted to show some of the awesome features that I know we haven't really had a chance to start playing with yet. Um, if you have any questions about anything you've seen here, um, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, if you would like to receive uh, professional development credit for watching these videos, uh, please take the quiz and then I will get you a certificate.